Lesson 12 Tried and Crucified Sabbath Afternoon September 14 As soon as it was day, the Sanhedrin again assembled, and again Jesus was brought into the council room. He had declared himself the Son of God, and they had construed his words into a charge against him. But they could not condemn him on this, for many of them had not been present at the night session, and they had not heard his words. And they knew that the Roman tribunal would find in them nothing worthy of death. But if from his own lips they could all hear those words repeated, their object might be gained. His claim to the Messiahship they might construe into a seditious political claim. Art thou the Christ? They said, Tell us. But Christ remained silent. They continued to ply him with questions. At last in tones of mournful pathos he answered, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I also ask you, you will not answer me, nor let me go. But that they might be left without excuse, he added the solemn warning, Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. The Desire of Ages, page 714. Priests and rulers forgot the dignity of their office and abused the Son of God with foul epithets. They taunted him with his parentage. They declared that his presumption in proclaiming himself the Messiah made him deserving of the most ignominious death. The most dissolute men engaged in infamous abuse of the Savior. An old garment was thrown over his head, and his persecutors struck him in the face, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? When the garment was removed, one poor wretch spat in his face. The angels of God faithfully recorded every insulting look, word, and act against their beloved commander. One day, the base men who scorned and spat upon the calm, pale face of Christ will look upon it in its glory, shining brighter than the sun. The Desire of Ages, page 715. As man's substitute and surety, the iniquity of men was laid upon Christ. He was counted a transgressor that he might redeem them from the curse of the law. The guilt of every descendant of Adam of every age was pressing upon his heart, and the wrath of God and the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity filled the soul of his son with consternation. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. The Story of Redemption, page 225. Sunday, September 15. Are you the King of the Jews? Jesus had many sympathizers in the company about him, and his answering nothing to the many questions put to him amazed the throng. Under all the mockery and violence of the mob, not a frown, not a troubled expression, rested upon his features. He was dignified and composed. The spectators looked upon him with wonder. They compared his perfect form and firm, dignified bearing with the appearance of those who sat in judgment against him and said to one another that he appeared more like a king than any of the rulers. He bore no marks of being a criminal. His eye was mild, clear, and undaunted, his forehead broad and high. Every feature was strongly marked with benevolence and noble principle. His patience and forbearance were so unlike man that many trembled. Even Herod and Pilate were greatly troubled at his noble, godlike bearing. The Story of Redemption, page 216. From the first, Pilate was convinced that Jesus was no common man. He believed him to be an excellent character and entirely innocent of the charges brought against him. The angels who were witnessing the scene marked the convictions of the Roman governor, and to save him from engaging in the awful act of delivering Christ to be crucified, an angel was sent to Pilate's wife and gave her information through a dream that it was the Son of God in whose trial her husband was engaged, and that he was an innocent sufferer. 
she immediately sent a message to Pilate stating that she had suffered many things in a dream on account of Jesus and warning him to have nothing to do with that holy man. The messenger, pressing hastily through the crowd, placed the letter in the hands of Pilate. As he read, he trembled and turned pale, and at once determined to have nothing to do with putting Christ to death. If the Jews would have the blood of Jesus, he would not give his influence to it, but would labor to deliver him. The Story of Redemption, page 217. Jesus lived not to please himself. He gave himself as a living, consuming sacrifice for the good of others. Those who receive Christ will drop out all that is uncourteous, harsh, and rough, and will reveal the pleasantness, the kindness that dwelt in Jesus, because Christ abides in the heart by faith. Christ was the light that shineth in darkness, and his followers are also to be the light of the world. Christ is our model, but unless we behold him, unless we contemplate his character, we shall not reflect his character in our practical life. He was meek and lowly in heart. He never did a rude action, never spoke a discourteous word. The Lord is not pleased with our blunt, hard, unsympathetic ways toward others. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. We are to be a representation of Jesus Christ. As the Lord of life and glory came to our world to represent the Father, so we are to go to the world to represent Jesus. That I may know him, page 306. Monday, September 16. Hail, King of the Jews! Satan and his angels were tempting Pilate and trying to lead him on to his own ruin. They suggested to him that if he did not take part in condemning Jesus, others would. The multitude were thirsting for his blood, and if he did not deliver him to be crucified, he would lose his power and worldly honor and would be denounced as a believer on the impostor. Through fear of losing his power and authority, Pilate consented to the death of Jesus, and notwithstanding he placed the blood of Jesus upon his accusers, and the multitude received it, crying, His blood be on us and on our children, yet Pilate was not clear. He was guilty of the blood of Christ. For his own selfish interest, his love of honor from the great men of earth, he delivered an innocent man to die. If Pilate had followed his own convictions, he would have had nothing to do with condemning Jesus. Early Writings, page 174. Jesus was taken, faint with weariness and covered with wounds, and scourged in the sight of the multitude, and the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole band. And they clothed him with purple, and plaited a crown of thorns, and put it about his head, and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they did spit upon him, and bowing their knees worshipped him. Occasionally some wicked hand snatched the reed that had been placed in his hand, and struck the crown upon his brow, forcing the thorns into his temples, and sending the blood trickling down his face and beard. Satan led the cruel mob in its abuse of the Savior. It was his purpose to provoke him to retaliation if possible, or to drive him to perform a miracle to release himself, and thus break up the plan of salvation. The Desire of Ages, page 734. Those who derided his claim to be the Son of God are speechless now, at Christ's return. There is the haughty Herod who jeered at his royal title and bade the mocking soldiers crown him king. There are the very men who with impious hands placed upon his form the purple robe, upon his sacred brow the thorny crown, and in his unresisting hand the mimic scepter, and bowed before him in blasphemous mockery. The men who smote and spit upon the Prince of Life now turn from his piercing gaze and seek to flee from the overpowering glory of his presence. Those who drove the nails through his hands and feet, the soldier who pierced his side, behold these marks with terror and remorse. And now there rises a cry of mortal agony, louder than the shout, 
crucify him, crucify him, which rang through the streets of Jerusalem, swells the awful despairing wail. He is the son of God. He is the true Messiah. They seek to flee from the presence of the King of Kings. In the deep caverns of the earth, rent asunder by the warring of the elements, they vainly attempt to hide. The Great Controversy, page 643. Tuesday, September 17. The Crucifixion. Upon arriving at the place of execution, the condemned were bound to the instruments of torture. While the two thieves wrestled in the hands of those who stretched them upon the cross, Jesus made no resistance. The mother of Jesus looked on with agonizing suspense, hoping that he would work a miracle to save himself. She saw his hands stretched upon the cross, those dear hands that had ever dispensed blessings and had been reached forth so many times to heal the suffering. And now the hammer and nails were brought, and as the spikes were driven through the tender flesh and fastened to the cross, the heart-stricken disciples bore away from the cruel scene the fainting form of the Mother of Christ. Jesus made no murmur of complaint. His face remained pale and serene, but great drops of sweat stood upon his brow. There was no pitying hand to wipe the death dew from his face, nor words of sympathy and unchanging fidelity to stay his human heart. He was treading the winepress all alone, and of all the people there was none with him. While the soldiers were doing their fearful work, and he was enduring the most acute agony, Jesus prayed for his enemies. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. That prayer of Christ for his enemies embraced the world, taking in every sinner who should live until the end of time. The Story of Redemption, pages 221 and 222. In the sufferings of Christ upon the cross, prophecy was fulfilled. Centuries before the crucifixion, the Savior had foretold the treatment he was to receive. He said, Dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Psalm 22 verses 16 to 18. The prophecy concerning his garments was carried out without counsel or interference from the friends or the enemies of the crucified one. To the soldiers who had placed him upon the cross, his clothing was given. Christ heard the men's contention as they parted the garments among them. His tunic was woven throughout without seam, and they said, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be. The Desire of Ages Page 746. And when the fullness of time was come, the one appointed in the councils of heaven came to the earth as an instructor. He was no less a being than the creator of the world, the son of the infinite God. The rich benevolence of God gave him to our world, and to meet the necessities of humanity, he took on him human nature. To the astonishment of the heavenly host, he walked this earth as the eternal word. Fully prepared, he left the royal courts to come to a world marred and polluted with sin. Mysteriously, he allied himself to human nature. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. God's excess of goodness, benevolence, and love was a surprise to the world, of grace which could be realized but not told. Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 399. Wednesday, September 18. Forsaken by God. Every pang endured by the Son of God upon the cross, the blood drops that flowed from his head, his hands, and feet, the convulsions of agony which racked his frame, and the unutterable anguish that filled his soul at the hiding of his father's face from him, speak to man, saying, 
It is for love of thee that the Son of God consents to have these heinous crimes laid upon him. For thee he spoils the domain of death and opens the gates of paradise and immortal life. He who stilled the angry waves by his word and walked the foam-capped billows, who made devils tremble and disease flee from his touch, who raised the dead to life and opened the eyes of the blind, offers himself upon the cross as the last sacrifice for man. He, the sin-bearer, endures judicial punishment for iniquity and becomes sin itself for man. The Story of Redemption, page 225. The rending of the veil of the temple showed that the Jewish sacrifices and ordinances would no longer be received. The great sacrifice had been offered and had been accepted, and the Holy Spirit, which descended on the day of Pentecost, carried the minds of the disciples from the earthly sanctuary to the heavenly, where Jesus had entered by his own blood to shed upon his disciples the benefits of his atonement. But the Jews were left in total darkness. They lost all the light which they might have had upon the plan of salvation and still trusted in their useless sacrifices and offerings. The heavenly sanctuary had taken the place of the earthly, yet they had no knowledge of the change. Therefore they could not be benefited by the mediation of Christ in the holy place. Early Writings, page 259 Heavenly agencies have to contend with hindrances before the purpose of God is fulfilled in its time. Good and evil angels are taking a part in the planning of God in His earthly kingdom. It is God's purpose to carry forward His work in correct lines, in ways that will advance His glory. But Satan is ever trying to counterwork God's purpose. Only by humbling themselves before God can God's servants advance His work. Never are they to depend on their own efforts or on outward display for success. As a people, we do not understand as we should the great conflict going on between invisible agencies, the controversy between loyal and disloyal angels. The written word is our only safety. We must pray, as did Daniel, that we may be guarded by heavenly intelligences. As ministering spirits, angels are sent forth to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. Pray, my brethren, pray as you have never prayed before. We are not prepared for the Lord's coming. We need to make thorough work for eternity. Ellen G. White comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1173. Thursday, September 19. Laid to Rest Even in death, Christ's body was very precious to his disciples. They longed to give him an honored burial, but knew not how to accomplish this. In this emergency, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus came to the help of the disciples. Both these men were members of the Sanhedrin and were acquainted with Pilate. Both were men of wealth and influence. They were determined that the body of Jesus should have an honorable burial. Joseph went boldly to Pilate and begged from him the body of Jesus. For the first time, Pilate learned that Jesus was really dead. Conflicting reports had reached him in regard to the events attending the crucifixion, but the knowledge of Christ's death had been purposely kept from him. Pilate had been warned by the priests and rulers against deception by Christ's disciples in regard to his body. Upon hearing Joseph's request, he therefore sent for the centurion who had charge at the cross, and learned for a certainty of the death of Jesus. He also drew from him an account of the scenes of Calvary confirming the testimony of Joseph. The Desire of Ages, pages 772 and 773. Gently and reverently, they, Joseph, Nicodemus, and John, removed with their own hands the body of Jesus from the cross. Their tears of sympathy fell fast as they looked upon his bruised and lacerated form. Joseph owned a new tomb, hewn in a rock. This he was reserving for himself, but it was near Calvary, and he now prepared it for Jesus. The body, together with the spices brought by Nicodemus, was carefully wrapped in a linen sheet, and the Redeemer was borne to the tomb. 
There the three disciples straightened the mangled limbs and folded the bruised hands upon the pulseless breast. The Galilean women came to see that all had been done that could be done for the lifeless form of their beloved teacher. Then they saw the heavy stone rolled against the entrance of the tomb. And the Savior was left at rest. The women were last at the cross and last at the tomb of Christ. While the evening shades were gathering, Mary Magdalene and the other Marys lingered about the resting place of their Lord, shedding tears of sorrow over the fate of him whom they loved. The Desire of Ages, page 774. God does not prevent the plottings of wicked men, but he causes their devices to work for good to those who in trial and conflict maintain their faith and loyalty. Biblical examples of human steadfastness bear witness to the faithfulness of God's promises, of his abiding presence and sustaining grace. They testify to the power of faith to withstand the powers of the world. It is the work of faith to rest in God in the darkest hour, to feel, however sorely tried and tempest-tossed, that our Father is at the helm. The eye of faith alone can look beyond the things of time to estimate aright the worth of the eternal riches. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 574 and 575. For further reading, Lift Him Up, Conqueror Over the Power of Darkness, page 235, and The Desire of Ages, It Is Finished, pages 758 to 764.